Eduardo Ramirez getting the fifth round stoppage of Miguel Flores. You know, I thought Ramirez looked like the total package. I thought he looked like a very aggressive but defensively responsible Mexican style fighter. And with a lot of these featherweights, a lot of them have moved up in weight recently. You know, guys like Leo, perfect example. Um, and, you know, Tank Davis and some others where featherweight is a little more up for grabs than it used to be. I think this guy's aggressive style and his hand speed and his confidence, that's really the big one too, is I've seen hit some of his earlier fights where he's a little less confident. I saw him lose to to Claudio Morero. You know, he just looks like he, he's got that belief, like he's got the sauce a little bit, you know what I mean? He's got He's got that little extra swagger in his step. Like, yo, when I hit you, you you're going to feel it. Because you could see he had that mentality coming forward against Flores. And he's got 24 wins, 11 knockouts. It's not like he's a big puncher. But he has that mentality now of a killer. You know, so I think anybody at featherweight Flores is dangerous. I, absolutely. Um, you know, the second fight was Jose Cito Lopez winning. Or, or actually, he stopped Francisco Santana in the 10th round. You know, Jose Cito Lopez has been around forever, man. That dude's been around forever. And he's fought so many killers in his era and of the era before this, you know, and he is still fresh and he's still getting better and he's still relevant. I mean, it's really kind of amazing, you know, especially when, how he looked in the Thurman fight, you know, that he is with Robert Garcia and his skills are this fine tuned right now. I mean, I'm not saying he wasn't technical, but he was not this technical when he fought Canelo and when he fought Maidana and, <clears throat> when he fought all of these top guys that he's been in with, you know, he, his, his technical game, his ability to stay disciplined and box and do, and the subtle parts of the game are so much better than I've, than I've seen them. You know, he really does look like a re rejuvenated fighter at 36. You know, that that's what I'm saying. Like we're boxing age is less about the number and more about how much punishment you take in and how, how you care for your body outside the ring. And he looks like a guy who's just in shape. He's just an in shape dude who's who stays ready, you know. And that's hard to do if you're not getting big fights or if you're not as active as you want to be, you know. He's got that veterans record. He's thirty eight and eight with twenty one knockouts, and he's fought so many top guys, you know. I think that I don't think a win like this puts him at the elite level because Santana's sort of a fringe contender, but Santana's a tough dude. In theory, these two guys would be at a similar kind of level, maybe. And he sh and Lopez showed that that's not the case at all. That he's very much at a different level than somebody like Santana. And so, to me, in my mind, now he's sort of in that shuffle of the lower half of the welterweight top ten. You know, he's in that mix with Ugas and Jamal James and Abu Ramos and maybe even Danny Garcia and you know. Sean Porter, the guys that aren't the top, top, top of welterweight, you kind of have to put Lopez in that mix. You know, truthfully, I would love to see him and like a Louis Colazzo, you know, because he's another guy in his 30s that can still get it done or or Jamal James or somebody else that's in the bottom part of that top 10 to really see where Lopez is at. Like, is he a feasible opponent potentially for the elite of the sport? You know, because I think the Keith fight shows that he is. You know, he almost knocked Keith Thurman out. So, you know, Jose Cito Lopez, I think, is ready for part two of his career. It's probably going to be a little shorter. But I think whatever comes next for him, he's going to be as equipped for it as he's ever been in his whole career. So, tremendous performance, particularly for a guy in his mid-30s. The last fight before the main event was the six foot six junior middleweight Sebastian Fundora stopping Habib Ahmed in the second round. You know, Fundora is like a little freaky man. You know, being six six and being at that weight class, regardless of who you're in with, you're gonna look way bigger than them. The difference now is he's really learned how to fight tall. He's really learned how to keep at least in this fight, he kept this guy right on the end of his punches the whole time. 
and he never fell in. Whereas anytime I've seen him before, he's way more inclined to fall in, to stay in the pocket too long, to take punches. And in my mind, I was like, this could be the thing that holds him back is he doesn't understand his, how to use his size. And he keeps giving that up. And now he's taking punishment he doesn't need to take, you know, purely because of his mentality and his style. In this fight, he kept this guy on the end of all his punches. His jab was much busier. It looked like the concept of fighting like a tall fighter clicked for him. Like, whoa, this makes this a lot easier. And maybe I can even get knockouts faster because I'm getting the full torque of all of my shots, you know. And none of these guys I'm fighting are going to have that torque that I have because none of them are 6'6". None of them have an 80 plus inch wingspan, you know what I mean? And I think if this guy can stay tall and long for the most part, I think the fact that he fought early in his career more on the inside will be an advantage because if he's fighting somebody and he's fighting tall and for whatever reason they're slippery enough to get inside, he can handle himself. I think that makes him a more total package. And on top of that, I really feel like he's only going to move up in weight. And as he moves up in weight, I think he's going to get stronger and faster and sharper I think he's just going to, and I could be wrong, we'll see. But I think this this guy's got a lot of potential. I think for the height and the speed and the length, he's just going to get bigger and better. That's my take. And I think that could be soon. But, you know, he's 22, 23 years old. He's got plenty of time. He's just getting going. You know, he could easily be a light heavyweight before it's all said and done. We'll see. Um... You know, and then we had the main event. We had Errol Spence Jr. against Danny Garcia getting a clear, clear, clear cut unanimous decision. Um, I had the fight 116, 112, 117, 111, somewhere in there. Um, and you know, Errol Spence is back, man. It's a it's a it's a crazy epic comeback. You know, that after that car accident, you see what that car looked like, you see what his face looked like. You know, just the fact that he can box, that he can train, and then the fact that a year later, 14 months later, whatever, he could fight at this level, that's an amazing comeback, man. That's, you know, similar level to Danny Jacobs' comeback from cancer. It's not exactly the same, but it's really, it's pretty fucking epic, man. Um, It's one of the, it's, it's the best comeback since that, that's for sure. And... The I think the real way you know he's back is that the fight looked how I would have thought it looked pre-accident. You know what I mean? Like, if they signed this fight the day after the Porter fight, that's what I thought it would look like. You know, because Danny did his thing a little bit, you know? Danny, especially in the first half of the fight, was able to do some counter-punching. You know, and was landing hard body shots. Occasionally landing kind of a looping right hand over the top. The problem for Danny at this level at welterweight is that he's not active enough. He's not active enough. He doesn't throw enough punches, man. He's he's he keeps his hands in his pockets for too long. He's a little too selective. He's not he's just not busy enough. You know, his mentality is that of a counterpuncher. You know, his his whole thinking, his whole mentality in the ring, his whole disposition is about trying to get you to make the first move, overcommit, I make you pay for it. The problem is if somebody's really smart like Errol and they can keep the fight at the end of their jab and they can stay busier and outwork you and not be as concerned about landing the shot or about, you know, blasting you with power on every single shot, you know, you can outbox that style. If that style is not willing, you know, because there was no point where Danny made Errol question whether or not he should let his jab go. There was no point. Really, I felt like where Errol was like, all right, I can't get off two or three right now because the reality is Danny's coming back with one. And he's always coming back with one. And even if it's a good one, it's one. So the the at welterweight, at this level at welterweight, it's hard for Danny Garcia to get decisions because, yeah, he, he'll crack you and he's got good power, but he doesn't get a lot of knockouts. 
because he's not busy enough and because it's at welterweight. You know, at junior welterweight, I think it was, you know, he had a little bit more fight-changing power. I still think he has fight-changing power. But I, at this level, against the very top four or five welterweights in the world, it's just not enough. It's enough to lose a decision, you know. So for Errol, you know, everything went right in this fight. He was active. He had great punch resistance. You know, when Danny did hit him, he took it well. You know, Danny landed hard body shots, man. The first half of the fight, Danny was cracking him with some body shots. Landed some good stuff upstairs. That looping right hand is always dangerous, but, you know, Errol just handled it all really well. And he's another guy where he's super patient and he knows the right moment to kind of bring a new energy or to or to change the game up. Okay, this is the round I start to box and I'm I throw him off his game, or this is the round I get a little more aggressive and I, I catch him off off balance with it, you know. I felt like Errol Spence was able to do what Errol Spence wanted. And that's partly because he's a great fighter and he's fully recovered himself from this fucking horrible accident. But it's also, I think, the opponent. I think the opponent is not, as much as Danny Garcia was a great opponent and an elite level welterweight, it, the, stylistically, this is not the style of fight that's going to test Errol's capacity physically, you know, unless he just gets clipped and put out or hurt. You know, the style of Danny, it's like you got 30, 40 punches around coming at you, you know, tops. So if you can withstand that and, and withstand the accuracy, you know, and weather that storm, you can, he can be beat. And that's what Errol did. You know, as far as what's next for Errol, this is such an epic comeback that it's an, and, and such an epic comeback against such a, uh, uh, you know, a, a great opponent that it, it would it would not serve him to fight anybody other than Pacquiao or Crawford. If he's not fighting Pacquiao or Crawford, he better move up and wait. You know, I've seen the whole the three fight plan and whatever whatever it's like, dude, if you're not going to fight Terence Crawford or Manny Pacquiao or move up and wait, I don't care now. Cuz the thing is him, Crawford, Pacquiao, they've separated themselves as a top three, right? Terrence with the dominant win over Kel Brook. As long as Pacquiao is active, I think he's a top-level guy, and especially after the Thurman fight, you know, and Errol has separated himself. Those three guys have separated themselves. It doesn't necessarily serve any of them to fight somebody below that, except for Pacquiao. Pacquiao has nothing to prove. You know, Spence and Crawford ultimately are the two younger fighters with something to prove. And I think that they have to fight each other or they have to fight Manny. There's really no, there's no other opponents for either of them that really matter, particularly for Spence where, okay, now you fought Sean, you fought Danny. You know, other than Keith, there's, not, there's no other top-level welterweights at PBC for him, to, for him to dance with. So it has to be Pacquiao. If it, they're going to keep it in-house, they have no choice but to do Spence and Pacquiao. Unless Pacquiao really doesn't want the fight, it seems like that's what they're going to do. Which I'm cool with, man. If he wanted to fight Manny Pacquiao and move up to junior middleweight and that's how you were going to keep it in-house, I'd om- not that I'm okay with it. I want to see him fight Crawford. But you couldn't say he's ducking Crawford if that's what he's doing. you know. And Crawford hasn't proved himself as- against as many of the lower part of the top ten the way that Spence has. He's fought Porter. He's fought Danny Garcia. He fought Kel Brook a couple of years ago. You know, he's fought Lamont Peterson. He's, you know, Spence has been fighting top-level welterweights for a couple of years now. And Crawford really hasn't. So, ultimately, and I don't, I don't, I'm not sophisticated enough in a business sense to know how this gets done. But I don't entirely see how, you know, I, in my mind, it feels like it's on Crawford. It's on Crawford to make that push or to to make the appeal of the fight so great that there's no other fight worth making, you know, and, and his body of work to me is just not there. You know, I love the, the Kel Brook win. It's an elite level win, but that's kind of like a start, you know, that, that, that shouldn't have been the first time he had to do that at welterweight. Shouldn't have been the first time, you know, so ultimately... I hope that those two guys can put that fight together because there's so often in boxing, 
that there's a great fight that can be made that doesn't get made because you know they they keep trying to build it and they keep trying to build it and they keep trying to build it and then somebody loses or somebody gets hurt or whatever the case may be a perfect example Anthony Joshua and Deontay Wilder you know how fucking quick did the zip come off of that fight like you know Joshua loses to Ruiz and then Wilder loses to Fury it's like you know two years ago everybody was talking about Wilder Joshua I'm not saying that's not a good fight still, but it doesn't have the same zip because you kept taking risks and you kept putting both of these guys in with other top level heavyweights. It's like, that's how you get that shit ruined. You know, that I heard somewhere that I don't remember where, but I heard somewhere that Arrow was talking about fighting Keith Thurman. Like in my mind, that's a stupid fight to take because that's a fight you could lose. And it's not, it doesn't have the same marketability or even prestige as a Crawford or a Pacquiao fight you know so now you're just now you're putting your fighter in a position where they're taking risky fights you know and what's the what's the end game is it just are you just giving them risky fights or is there a build-up and if there is a build-up they need to make that more obvious and clear like yo this is part of a long-term plan to put these fights together you know I don't want to see Spence and Thurman I like I want to see it but I don't want to see it now I want to I want to see it when it's at its most important. What's most important right now is Spence Crawford or Spence Pacquiao or Pacquiao Crawford. And whoever gets left out of that mix gets left out of that mix. You know, I it's like what do you even say to them? You know, they have to they have to I, and I don't again, I don't know enough about the business and how exactly these things go down. You know, but it just seems like somebody's got to move their fucking weight around to make this thing happen. And I don't know how that happens, um, you know, but if he wanted to move up and fight, you know, Charlo or Lara or one of these junior middleweights, Jared Hurd, I would love to see that too. But none, no more of anyone that's like not an absolutely elite level fighter. Like it should only be big fights for this guy because he has clearly separated himself as a pound for pound fighter.